It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question this morning is for the Premier. Yesterday, Toronto's Medical Officer of Health released detailed uh, modelling, which showed that without action the Ford uh, from the Ford government, there could be more than 30,000 new cases of COVID-19 infections over the coming months, with a peak that won't arrive until the spring. Today, we have almost 800 new cases of COVID-19. So the Premier said he wants to see the evidence before he acts. Has he seen enough yet? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to reply. Well, we have been following the numbers very carefully as well, and there are some hot spots, as we all know, in Toronto and Peel and in Ottawa. We already have taken some steps to try and flatten the curve. The, uh, the, the problem with what has been done is the backlog. What's happening and the numbers that we're seeing now is as a result of infections that happened a week to 10 days ago. We have taken steps to make sure that unmonitored groups don't Order. come together, that we are dealing with bars and restaurants, only six people at a table, uh, making sure that uh, they, they close earlier. Uh, we are taking steps and monitoring this. We have received our own modelling, and we are considering what needs to be done in conjunction, I would say, with Dr. Davila. Dr. Williams is uh, in contact with her on a daily basis, and we are monitoring the situation very carefully. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, if those numbers are from a week ago, who knows what the numbers really are today? That is cold comfort from the Minister of Health. You know, the Premier spent months dithering and delaying, trying to save money when he should have been focusing on saving people. We know that the Premier failed to, uh, to fund expanded uh, testing back in April, even though the experts were pleading for him to do so. And doctors Order. and lab technicians tell us Order. that they're scrambling today because Ford's Conservatives wanted to save a buck. Once again, the Premier is refusing to act. Yep. I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to refer to other members by their title or their riding name. Leader of the Opposition, place your question. Absolutely, Speaker. Thank you. Once again, the Premier is refusing to act. Every day he refuses, this pandemic grows even worse. How much more evidence does this Premier need? How much does he need to see before he actually does something? Minister of Health. Well, we have a very substantive fall preparedness plan, keeping Ontarians safe, and we are putting that into action across a variety of scenarios, including putting a billion dollars into testing, tracing, and contact management. That is allowing us to do far more tests than we ever have before. In fact, yesterday in Ontario, we conducted 48,000 tests. That's a substantive increase even from a week ago. We are constantly building our ability. In contrast, I would tell you that Quebec did 20,000 tests yesterday. Ontario is a leader across the country in testing, tracing, and isolating, and we are doing that. We are going into communities. We are going into communities at risk, and we are making sure that we seek out the cases that are causing the problems. We know that some of the cases have been in certain areas in those hotspots, and that's where we are addressing our resources. The final supplementary. Speaker, might I remind the Minister of Health that, in fact, a couple of jurisdictions have abandoned contact tracing because they simply don't have the resources, because this government didn't fund them to have the resources to do that contact tracing. And it's already too late, Speaker, for the thousands and thousands of families who have lost and continue to lose loved ones uh, that the Premier could have prevented that from happening if he had actually stepped up to the plate. But he can take action right now, and he should. All summer, he refused to make the investments needed to stop the spread in our hospitals and long-term care, to keep students and teachers safe in the classrooms, to get proper testing in place. All of that should have been done during the summer. The Premier's dithering and delays have left us, left us completely unprepared for the second wave, which is upon us. Will the Premier finally stop ignoring Ignoring the evidence. Question. Stop trying to save a buck and invest the money desperately needed to bring order to the chaos that he has created in our province. Minister of Health to reply. 
Speaker, I would say to the Leader of the Official Opposition through you that that is absolutely incorrect. We have taken steps since the beginning of this pandemic and invested hundreds of millions of dollars into being prepared. We have the Fall Preparedness Plan and we've put money behind each and every one of those steps. We're ready for the biggest uh, flu immunization campaign in Ontario's history. We've put $935 million into hospitals this year, a 5.5 per cent increase, which is the greatest increase in over a decade. We've put money, $124 million, into opening reactivation care centres so that we can have the capacity in our hospitals to deal with COVID-19. And we've also invested over $300 million to get caught up on all of the surgeries and backlog procedures, MRIs and CT scans. We have taken every action necessary, Spons? every step along the way, and we're going to continue to make those investments. We've invested and we're responding and taking action. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier, but I'll inform the Health Minister that I'll take the word of experts on the front lines because those are the folks who know what's really going on and are prepared to say so publicly. Ontario's patient ombudsman confirmed in a report today what families and residents of long-term care have been telling us for months, Speaker. Decades of cuts from both the Liberals and the Conservatives have left a broken long-term care system that is unable to protect our seniors in the face of COVID. COVID-19. Understaffing, a lack of inspections, and decades of cuts have created a system where staff were forced to work when they were sick with COVID-19, couldn't access proper protective equipment, PPE, Order. and residents were left in bed literally for months at a time. The Ombudsman is joining a course of people calling for urgent changes. Will, when will those changes be in place? Speaker? Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. It's a very important question that I'd like to uh, provide really substantial progress uh, in terms of what we're doing in terms of IPAC, in terms of staffing, in terms of funding for our homes, creating the partnerships that the uh, patient ombudsman uh, has asked for. And I would really like to thank the uh, patient ombudsman office and the patient ombudsman for the work that they have done on this. It was uh, very insightful and obviously uh, 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 work that was uh, deeply um, uh, felt by them. So I appreciate everyone who's working so hard in long-term care. Many of these areas that she um, that they have touched on, we have already um, implemented, uh, including the partnerships, which is ongoing to make sure that our homes have support from the hospitals, as I mentioned. The staffing is a priority, and our, our government Response? is putting dollars behind that as we speak. And the caregiver piece that we have uh, implemented at the beginning of September. So we're, we continue to work, continue to add layers, and we'll keep at this. We will be focused, and we will continue to support. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Speaker, the second wave of COVID-19 is already here, and we are seeing the tragic consequences in long-term care. Ottawa's for-profit West End Villa has seen 19 deaths now since August. Now we're seeing new outbreaks and deaths in Toronto and Beaton at uh, long-term care homes. 50 seniors, literally half of the residents at the for-profit Fairview Nursing Home, have been diagnosed with COVID-19. The Ombudsman has called for urgent changes, a boost in staffing, and a protection for whistleblowers. Why are these measures not already in place, Speaker, and when will they be? Mr. Longton, here. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, so thanks for raising those issues, and, and that is something, all of those issues are areas that we are working uh, extremely hard on and, and taking our very, uh, our most vigilance to address them. This is happening as we speak. I want to uh, mention again that outbreak means uh, one resident or one staff case in the home. And right now we have uh, 44 homes with no resident cases, although they are considered in outbreak. Uh, two homes in Ottawa with resident cases, and those homes are stabilizing. And this is very much better compared to the first wave, whether it's uh, through the partnerships with our hospitals, working with our chief medical officer of, officers of health, the medical officer of health, and making sure that we do every, every measure based on evidence, based on data, 
Our homes are stabilizing. Many of the homes that are in outbreak right now have no resident cases. Uh, 44 homes Response. have no resident cases. And so we will continue to take advice from the patient ombudsman, from other groups, to make sure that we're doing everything possible to support our homes. And we'll keep doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the minister talks about urgency, but what people say, what people see is dithering, delays, and penny pinching by the Ford government. What terrifies residents and frontline staff in long term care is that despite months of promises, we still aren't ready. And she knew that because the, the minister received a letter identifying that by the people who are first hand have first hand experience with long term care there is still no legislative minimum when it comes to uh, standards when it comes to hands on care there is still no meaningful staffing strategy there is still not enough ppe for the workers in long term care whistleblowers are still not protected here in the province of ontario we're entering the second wave with fewer health care resources burnt out workers and exhausted and terrified family members the Premier promised he would spare no expense when it comes to protecting Shin. our seniors in long-term care. Why did the Premier break the promise? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I thank you to the member opposite for the question. Unfortunately, that's a mischaracterization on many points here, of what here. is actually happening. Um, our government has been committed to the safety and well-being of long-term care residents, and we, we've, we've not only got plans and working on those plans ever since the new Ministry of Long-Term Care, a standalone ministry demonstrating the dedication of this government, making sure that we put dollars behind our plans. Initially, $243 million to help stabilize our homes. Uh, the the uh, emergency orders that we put out, four sets of those, the amended regulations. We have been working speedily and active this whole time to an evolving, unprecedented threat, invisible intruder, into our long-term care homes. Our homes uh, have been advised they, they, they have six to eight weeks of PPE. That was at last week's announcement, $540 million, half a billion dollars, going to assist our homes in staffing, in IPAC training, in, in uh, minor capital repairs to enable them to fight COVID Response. more effectively. Our government has demonstrated its willingness to understand the science, to work with the experts. We continue to do this. We will stay focused, and we will get this job done. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, even as the Premier blustered about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on small business and jobs, his president of the Treasury Board was confirming that small business tax deferrals had come to an end and boasting that he planned to collect every penny of deferred taxes from small businesses. As always, there is a massive gap between what the Premier says and what the Ford government actually does. Tax deferrals push debt down the road. Now the government has come to collect. In the middle of phase two of this pandemic. Is this really the Premier's plan to help small business and protect jobs? The Associate, I'm sorry, the uh, Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Finance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and we recognize how difficult these times are for small businesses out there, and that's why there has been $11 billion in direct support for these businesses, Mr. Speaker, $241 million in the form of a commercial rent relief program that has provided relief to 60,000 commercial tenants here in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, that is over 604,000 employees who have been assisted by this rent relief program. But we understand that there is still suffering going on, and that's why we continue to collaborate with the federal government. Just this morning, the Minister of Finance here in Ontario was communicating with Minister Freeland about additional supports, and those additional supports will be coming uh, soon. It will be announced in our multi-year plan, on our recovery plan, on or before November 15th of this year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And for Waterloo. Well, I want to say that those businesses in Ontario would love to see that $11 billion because they have not seen it. The Premier says he's refusing to act on desperately needed COVID measures because it could hurt small businesses and cost jobs. But those small businesses are already hurting. Jobs are already being lost. If we want to get this second wave of COVID-19 under control, we need to provide direct support to small businesses to pay for their rent, which is their number one ask, and to protect jobs. The Premier's half measures and now tax 
tax clawbacks will only make things worse. Will the government stop trying to save a buck, make the investments now to save jobs and small businesses before they disappear? They deserve our real support in the province of Ontario. Associate Minister of Small Business, Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. From the onset of this pandemic, this government has been committed to supporting small businesses. We understand the challenges that small businesses are having, and that is why we continue to not only consult but also act on those consultations, like direct supports uh, through the Commercial Emergency Relief Program that saw over $241 million from the province and close to a billion uh, in total with the federal uh, government support over 500,000 employees. Over 55,000 businesses. Our investment uh, in Digital Main Street to help the businesses pivot to e-commerce digital uh, uh, platforms helped support 23,000 businesses in this province, $2,500 grants for the hardest hit businesses. Uh, just yesterday, I had the opportunity to announce uh, a $60 million program uh, that will support Main Street businesses with $1,000 to cover the costs of PPE because they have stepped up uh, and protected not only the employees but the consumers. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to support small businesses and invest in them. The next question, the member from Mississauga East, Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Minister, you often say Ontario offers the world in one province. That's why every year there are thousands of festivals and events exploring different cultures and bringing us all together. This year has brought drastic change. Festivals and events across the province were left with the tough decision to cancel altogether or significantly alter their programming. My question for the minister is what the government is doing to help these amazing festivals and event organizers successfully and safely adopt their events. Thank you. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you to the member from Mississauga, East Cooksville. I had the opportunity over an 11-week period to travel through every corner of Ontario, and I was able to join him at his, in his riding, and we, we took in a few events uh, and uh, took a really nice tour of his community. Um, I understand, Speaker, that uh, it's very hard for un Ontarians to gather, and we recognize that this is, first and foremost, a public health crisis. We also recognize within this ministry that there's an economic and social crisis as well, which is why we flowed $9 million early during the pandemic to pre preserve and protect existing festivals and events who had to either shutter, um, postpone, or go digitally. And earlier today, I, I announced that the Ontario government will be um, an, uh, putting forward a plan to reconnect Ontarians safely, virtually, digitally, and through other means uh, in order to bring uh, Ontarians uh, the traditional experiences that they love so much around Halloween, around uh, Remembrance Week, around Hanukkah, Christmas, and of course, New Year's. And so that $9 million fund Response. over the today uh, will we'll be retroactive to August the 12th and will help fund events right up until March 31st. We can reconnect um, and still have that experience. And Santa, of course, is coming to town as of, as of uh, December the 5th. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for being a champion for those in the culture industries across this province as they fight to overcome the challenges of COVID-19. <coughs> Minister, I know I speak for many Ontarians when I say community events have been greatly missed. The ReConnect program will definitely help support many events across the province as they work to adapt to the new safety guidelines. I look forward to seeing the innovative approaches taken by organizers to ensure health and safety measures are met while still being able to connect us all together. Minister, what are some ways organizers can use the funding from this program to enhance the possibilities of a successful and safe events? Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much. Earlier today, I joined musictogether.ca along with the Toronto Original uh, Santa Claus Parade to talk about how they would uh, be able to access this type of funding as well as municipalities across this great province. We want them to regroup, reimagine, and of course, reconnect with their neighbours. Some of the experiences that will be eligible um, for these organizations would be drive through pumpkin lighting, uh, virtual Remembrance Day events, uh, reverse holiday parades and drive-by uh, floats, uh, static floats, drive-in music concerts and movies, 
holiday tree lightings, and of course, Speaker, I think we're all prepared to say goodbye to 2020, so we will be investing in New Year's Eve events as well. I encourage all members to go back to their communities uh, over this Thanksgiving weekend and find out how they can uh, access this funding, and this funding will be used for eligible expenses such as programming and production, promotion, mobile applications Response. and website development and speaker we look forward to having everyone safely we reconnect virtually or through drive-by experience this season thank you the next question the member for london west uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has shone a light on the urgent need for access to childcare in Ontario. But instead of opening up new spaces and providing some stability to the sector, the response from this government is to increase the size of childcare groupings, putting 12-month-old infants in a room with two-year-olds and making other changes that experts say will result in worse, not better care. Can the Premier explain why he is using the cover of a pandemic to try and sneak through changes that could harm children in Ontario? Minister of Education. Oh, well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, two years ago when we came to office, we inherited the most expensive child care in Canada after the former Liberal government. Order. That is or order. Leader of the Opposition, come to order. Member for Waterloo, come to order. Over here. Government House Leader, come to order. Order. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. Minister of Education, please reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, it should not be controversial that we make clear that affordability is a centerpiece of our program when it's clear during this recession, during this pandemic that we have many people who cannot participate in the labour market because they are hindered by access and because of affordability, compounded by the former government who did nothing to create childcare space. It was this government last year that created, helped facilitate the creation Response. of 19,000 net new spaces. Our plan is to consult the sector midstream while we deal with this pandemic to ensure childcare is affordable, is accessible for working parents every single day now and well into the future. Order. Member for Davenport, come to order. Place your supplementary, member for London West. Speaker, it's not just that infants will be placed with two-year-olds. The Premier's proposed changes would also move two-year-olds from a room with 15 children to a room with 24 children. There would be fewer trained, caring ECEs and non-licensed staff filling ECE roles. Larger rooms and fewer staff is not what parents want, it's not what children need, and it's not what experts and educators say is best. Speaker, COVID-19 has highlighted what families have been saying for decades. We need more high-quality, affordable, public, licensed care, not new rules to water down the care we have. I ask again, why is this government trying to bury these wrong-headed changes in the middle of a pandemic when families are already stressed to the max? Minister of Education, response. Speaker, what families expect is for the government to work immediately to make sure childcare is accessible for families now and in the future. Let me advise the member what, in fact, this consultation aims to do. We're aiming to improve quality of childcare in the earlier setting, creating flexible options for families, flexibility which does not exist for many parents, creating a more uh, enhancing the workforce retention, trying to work to ensure we have more ECs within the system. Clarifying the requirements for the inclusion of children with special needs is an important part of this consultation. Ensuring culturally relevant programming is, is important for new Canadians that come to this country. And reducing the, the administrative burden and the red tape on those nonprofits, on those organizations that are providing childcare within our community. Speaker, we are working very hard to ensure that parents can get back to work, and we will do everything we can to make sure it is affordable for parents in this province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontarians will never forget the infamous leaked video during the 2018 campaign where the Premier promised to open big chunks of the Greenbelt for developers. He backtracked then, and he backtracked again when the public outcry against opening the Greenbelt for development happened with Bill 66. Well, tonight, Speaker, York Region councillors are voting on a resolution to ask the province to open the Greenbelt land for industrial and commercial development. Speaker, every time this comes up, 
The Premier is forced to backtrack and apologize and reconfirm a commitment to not open the Greenbelt for development. So my question is, is, will the Premier keep his promise to the people of Ontario to maintain existing protections for all two million acres of the Greenbelt, even if this resolution passes your Council tonight? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. Thanks, Speaker. And again, uh, to the, uh, through you, uh, Speaker, to the Honourable Member, the Premier and I and our government have been very, very clear. We have indicated over and over again, and quite frankly, when we've received resolutions and letters, and the member is right, the resolution hasn't been debated yet, I haven't got a, uh, a, I'm not in receipt of it, but we've made it very clear to people who have sent us resolutions about developing in the Green Belt that the answer is no. You know, I can, I can share those with you. You know that they exist because groups that uh, work with you have asked me uh, on certain developments, and we've been crystal clear. Speaker, we will again, through you, we will again uh, reiterate, like I have and like the Premier has so many times, we will protect the Green Belt in all its beauty. And the supplementary question. Pre uh, Speaker, I appreciate the Minister reconfirming that commitment. But the question is, is why does this keep coming up for debate if discussions weren't happening somewhere? And so some of this is I'm wondering if it's being driven by the streamlined environmental assessment for the GTAS West Highway 413, which will pave over parts of the Greenbelt and pave over 2,000 acres of prime farmland. Speaker, it is Ontario Agriculture Week. This is the week where we celebrate farmers, and we especially celebrate those farmers for their $30 billion contribution to our economy and for feeding us during this pandemic. So my question to the minister is, is will the minister commit to protecting farmers and farmland by not paving over any question. prime farmland whether it's with highways or subdivisions. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. I'm, I'm, you know, I, again, this member, um, we've been very clear. So, so I have got, I have got uh, a book full, Speaker, quite frankly, of resolutions that councils have. M member knows he can't use props. <laughs> Please reply. Local council speaker are democratically elected. They have debates in their chamber, just like we do. I cannot predict what requests I am going to get from Ontario's 444 municipalities. But I can tell you today, Speaker, and I can tell the members of the House and every head of council and every councillor in every community across Ontario that if you're going to give us a request to develop property within the Green Belt, we have one short answer, no. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much. Speaker, in August of 2019, I was joined by Premier Ford to announce important infrastructure investments in the Niagara area. Over $1.6 million of provincial funding is being invested to reconstruct 2.5 kilometres of Pelham Street in my riding. And in January, our government also invested nearly $10 million to the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, with over $3.3 million allocated to the city of Niagara Falls, nearly $1.1 million for Fort Erie, and over $1.1 million to Grimsby, to name just a few. Now, these investments will enhance the safety and reliability of the roadways across Niagara and will have a significant impact on the region's economic development. I'm proud our government is working with partners uh, to get projects built. So I'm wondering if the speaker could tell, sorry, uh, speaker, I'm wondering if the minister could tell the House uh, about the economic benefits of building key infrastructure projects such as these across Ontario. Minister of Infrastructure, to reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Niagara West for his important question and his advocacy for his constituents. Infrastructure is one of our province's key economic drivers. It creates jobs, keeps Ontarians healthy, and gets people where they need to go. Ontario has nominated over 140 road, bridge, air, and marine infrastructure projects for a total provincial investment of more than $115 million through the Rural and Northern Stream of the ICIP Bilateral Agreement. 
If all the rural and northern projects nominated to date are approved by the federal government, the joint investments could reach up to $592 million for Ontario's communities. We are also investing in hundreds of transit infrastructure projects across the Niagara region and other communities outside of the GTHA. Our government is and will continue to Response. work with our municipal partners, families and businesses to make smart investments in infrastructure to keep it reliable for the people of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. I know that Niagara has seen tens of millions of dollars of these funds flowing into our region, and we're very grateful for the minister's advocacy. Uh, Speaker, after announcing the nomination of several public transit, road and bridge infrastructure projects last year, this summer I was thrilled to be joined by my uh, municipal partners and federal counterparts parts to share that the federal government has approved a number of these nominations. Finally, Niagara municipalities can get shovels in the ground. These investments total over $14 million combined and will have a positive impact on the daily lives of my constituents. For example, more conventional expansion buses can be purchased and technology can be upgraded to improve operations and safety for transit users in the Niagara region. In West Lincoln, St. Anne Road will finally see the repairs it desperately needs. And notably, the replacement of a key Welling Canal bridge can finally get underway. And I know the members opposite will appreciate that as well. Would the minister tell the House when Niagara sure. Region will see more infrastructure projects like the ones announced over the summer? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. As you know, the projects from the Niagara area are part of the hundreds of projects we've submitted for review, and we're waiting for federal approval on several more. The member from Niagara West has been a strong advocate, sharing stories of damaged vehicles from blown tires to broken shocks because the potholes on St. Anne's Road. Ontario's infrastructure cannot be left to crumble to a state of disrepair. We've made progress towards improving Ontario's infrastructure, but the need for renewal remains. There's much more work to be done, but we can't do it alone. That's why Premier Doug Ford has called on the federal government to end approval delays and invest an additional $10 billion per year over 10 years to get shovels in the ground on infrastructure projects. Through strategic investment, we can continue to help improve the quality of life for all Ontarians. It's time for Response. Ontario to get its fair share of funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Judy owns Free Times Cafe, a restaurant and music venue that has been in the neighbourhood for over 40 years in my riding. Free Time supports local art and music and is a hub and an institution for the downtown Jewish community. Now Free Times is in trouble. The federal rent subsidy has ended and the second wave of COVID-19 is hitting hard. Judy cannot afford to cover the $10,000 a month in rent. She can't do it. Without financial support now, Free Times Cafe will be forced to shut down permanently. Speaker, will the Premier commit to providing direct rent relief to small businesses like Free Times. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and certainly uh, we, our understanding of the difficulties that businesses like Free Time are going through uh, during, these, uh, during this pandemic, Speaker, and that's why our government reacted very quickly in March with $3.7 billion in direct supports and increased that total in August to $11 billion in supports for individuals and businesses, Mr. Speaker. And our Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production has done hundreds of hours of consultations with small businesses, as has the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. And, Mr. Speaker, we continue to collaborate with our partners in Ottawa. Uh, we understand there is a need for continued support, and we call on the federal government to provide more relief on things like rent for small businesses in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, I know our Minister of Finance is hard at work continuously communicating with Minister Freeland in Ottawa, and, and we understand that there is more to be done and more will be done. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you. It's very important that the, the buck is just not passed to the federal government and back and forth. These small businesses are waiting for real action. Yeah, yeah. They are going under. Across my riding, across so many of our ridings, small businesses are struggling to keep their businesses open. Every single day I get contacted by businesses who say, I can't make it work anymore. Kathy, an owner of Santosha Yoga Studio, she can't afford the money to invest in virtual classes. Monty, the owner of Boat Tie Noodles, can't pay the utilities, which cost upwards of $1,500 a week. And Sneaky D's, the iconic music venue in my riding, is also facing closure. 
Speaker, it is not enough to rely on the goodwill of landlords or to offer grants for PPE. We need real relief. When will this government take real measures to save Main Street? Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and yes, the member is correct in saying that uh, small businesses face a number of challenges, and she mentioned PPE. And I, well, I was so happy to hear our Associate Minister of Small Business Red Tape Production announce $60 million in a grant directly for $1,000 uh, for businesses with 10 employees or less, Mr. Speaker. There's been a number of initiatives that we've introduced in that $11 billion bucket we announced in August, Mr. Speaker, but we recognize that there is more that needs to be done, and that's why we continue to consult with the sector. We continue to work with our partners in Ottawa and call on them for additional support. We are in this together, as the Premier always says, and that means all levels of governments must work together to provide small businesses that relief. Mr. Speaker, it's good that this government exercised fiscal prudence in its first two years, because that's why we have those funds available to protect those small businesses, and we will get through this together. Order. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Yesterday, Ontario's patient ombudsman, Kathy Fuchs, released a special report outlining concerns over co the response to COVID-19 in Ontario's long-term care homes. And among the 568 complaints she received, she noted that there were errors that caused some workers to be working with a COVID-positive 19 patient without PPE. Infected COVID-19 residents being left in the same room as an uninfected resident and staff shortages that required some people to work 15 to 18 hours a day. And the SWAT teams, the ministry promised, were slow and not effective. The Ombudsman says, many of the key public health risks remain the same for a second wave, and Ontarians should not expect a different result under the same conditions. So, Speaker, through you, what is the Minister of Long-Term Care doing to protect residents in long-term care home and prevent the spread of COVID-19? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our, our government across ministries, working with the, our, our sector and working with the experts, the scientific experts, the medical experts, the public health experts, working with all hundreds of people, really, to address the issues in long-term care. So staffing, obviously, priority. You've seen the dollars put forward, $540 million, over half a billion dollars just recently announced to address staffing. IPAC, the PPE. We're providing six to eight weeks of uh, PPE for all our long-term care homes. Uh, that is done um, from our, our government ministries to make sure that they have the protection that they require. And I will acknowledge that in the first wave, the global competition for PPE created uh, numerous challenges. We were getting uh, PPE to our homes, uh, some of them only within 24 hours of need, but we Fox. were getting them there. Uh, we're continuing to work on staffing uh, with the Ministry of Health. We are putting dollars behind that. We are continuing to work on staffing, IPAC capacity, emergency stabilization, and. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. So reasonable, rational, thoughtful people across this province, patient ombudsmen, infectious disease specialists, chief medical officers of health, are all saying the same thing. They're sounding the alarm. So. 14 homes in Ottawa are an outbreak. That's two more than yesterday. That's in the minister's backyard. One of those homes, West End Villa, has more than 130 cases and 19 residents have died. That's not a result that any of us want. Speaker, I don't want to hear answers with zeros attached to it, because that's not what matters. What matters is what's actually happening in the homes, and it's not happening, and people are telling the minister that. Question. And I don't know if she's not listening. <coughs> Through you, Speaker. What is the minister going to do to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in Ontario's long-term care homes and protect Thank you. <laughs> long-term care. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government, multiple ministries, hundreds of experts are working round the clock to ensure that our homes are supported in as many ways possible, looking at the scientific evidence as it evolves. But I, I want to take you to task a little bit on the, on the numbers you mentioned, because I was very clear earlier in this chamber that only two homes in Ottawa have any resident cases. And you've mentioned in over 100 cases. That is reflective of the staff that is being tested and our testing, our surveillance mechanisms are working and we're picking Order. up the tests that are positive and the, and the staff are self-isolating at home. Our surveillance is working. 98% of our homes across Ontario are not, ha, do not have any resident cases. The two homes in Ottawa, the West End Villa is being well taken care of. The Ottawa Hospital is involved. The Chief, Response. unfortunately, and my heart goes Order. out to everyone who's been affected by this. We will continue to do everything possible to use every tool, every measure, but I do take exception to the order. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Over the last few months, we have had all, we have all had to adapt our lives to the new normal. Ontarians have stepped up, made sacrifices, and worked hard to curb the spread of COVID-19. But doing so has challenged families across the province, especially those caring for children with special needs. Through you, Speaker, Minister, what has our government done to provide support to families caring for children with special needs? Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Burlington for the question this morning. Speaker, our government knows that providing support to families caring for children with special needs is crucial to ensuring that all members of that family are able to thrive. And that's why our government is investing an additional $20 million in the Special Services at Home program, and that will ensure more than 4,700 families get the help and support that they need to access things like respite so they get a break and programming for their child as well. This investment builds on existing initiatives uh, like the CARE tax credit that our government introduced last year. Uh, that means that families with children with severe disabilities are getting $8,250 per child in relief in childcare expenses, which is really important for those families. You know, we want these families to know, and we know they're experiencing extremely uh, trying times right now during COVID, that their government is here to help them during that difficult time. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, thank you so much, Minister, for all your hard work and compassion and passion in this ministry. I'm glad to hear that our government has expanded the reach of the Special Services at Home program to an additional 4,700 families with an investment of $20 million. But, Minister, during the outbreak of COVID-19, these families are spending more time at home, and many do not have access to their normal supports as we all work together to stop the spread of COVID-19. What is our government doing to ensure that families receiving funding through the Special Services at Home program are able to take advantage of this investment? Minister. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks again to the member from Burlington who does an outstanding job in representing these families in her community. Uh, Speaker, when we announced this investment, we knew that funding alone wasn't going to be enough. Uh, we needed to make sure that families would be able to spend their funding on what they needed when they needed it. And that's why we made it flexible, Speaker. That's why we expanded the list of eligible expenses to accommodate activities and services and supports that can be offered to individuals in their own homes, because a lot of them were confined to their own homes, unfortunately. This included access to items like arts and craft and recreational uh, facilities and, 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 and fitness activities and technology and those types of devices um, that they would normally access through their day programs, which unfortunately uh, have been cancelled because of COVID-19. We provided families with 25 per cent of their funding for this year in advance, and we knew these families needed support, and our government was quick to act to help. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This week, my office heard from Paul Wyman, whose wife Ursula is at A.R. Gowdy Long-Term Care Home in my riding of Kitchener Centre. Recently, Paul became an essential care worker for Ursula. 
This allowed them to reunite after months of separation, and it renewed her spirit. But then the second wave hit. Speaker, Paul placed 20 calls to make an appointment to get tested so he could be with his wife, only to find out that everything was booked solid for an entire week. So, Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Can the Premier tell Paul when he will be boosting testing capacity, especially for essential care workers, so that people can finally be with their loved ones? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I, I can tell the member opposite that we are already boosting capacity. We indicated that in a previous question that we conducted 48,000 tests yesterday, and we're well on our way to our 50,000 uh, goal by the end of this month, and then onward to 68,000 by mid-November. We're, we're boosting capacity and our lab capacity at the same time. However, we, uh, uh, we're asking for a bit of patience because we have moved to this new online appointment facility, which is better for people in the long run because once they have the test, they will receive the results sooner. So uh, please uh, ask him to continue with the request. There may be the possibility that he can also be tested at uh, a pharmacy as well if he wants to try and uh, book an appointment through a pharmacy for a test. And the supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. Paul is not the only one who's raising this issue in my office. Ken is an essential caregiver for his 96-year-old mother, who's also a resident at AR Gowdy. Like Paul, Ken told me that the testing backlog is keeping him from caring for his mother. He's literally considering driving two to three hours outside of Kitchener just to get tested. Families are filled with anxiety because they cannot reach their loved ones, but the Premier keeps telling us that this is all part of his plan. So will the Premier explain why there are no mechanisms in place to allow essential caregivers to be given testing priority and how he plans on fixing the mess that he's made? Mr. Health. Well, we are boosting capacity on a daily basis. Our numbers keep going up. We're at, at about 40,000 tests about two weeks ago. We're at 48,000 yesterday, and we're continuing to grow. We want essential caregivers to be able to go into long-term care facilities to help care for their loved ones. Uh, but I might suggest, as we are expanding capacity into more pharmacies and other locations, we want to be able to have more locations available for people to be tested. But perhaps uh, calling a pharmacy and arranging an appointment there if he's asymptomatic, which I'm assuming that he is, to uh, try and obtain a, a, an appointment there might be the best way for him to proceed because there is an ability for people who are essential. He's an essential caregiver in a long-term care facility. I think that would probably be the best way for him to try and approach it to be able to get in sooner to be with his loved one at the long-term care home. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for uh, the Premier. Uh, Ottawa has set a record again today, Mr. Speaker, 180 new, 182 new cases uh, in the nation's capital, and Madonna Care Community in Orleans is experiencing its fourth outbreak of COVID-19. COVID has penetrated Madonna's iron ring that the Premier said he would build four times, Mr. Speaker. Residents living in Madonna are facing the sixth and seventh invasive, uncomfortable COVID-19 tests, and of course, they're facing the isolation that comes uh, with uh, the declaration. Testing backlogs are stopping some employees from showing up uh, to work, and now staffing agencies are using loopholes in government regulations to move employees from one location to the next to the next. When is the government going to close the loophole and permanently and properly staff long-term care homes in Ottawa. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question to the member opposite. First of all, let me address Madonna. Um, and in Ottawa, uh, there are only two homes with resident cases. Madonna Care Community has no resident cases. Fourth it, outbreak. It has, and again, I, I reiterate the definition of an outbreak can mean no resident cases, no case of COVID in the home, but the staff being picked up on surveillance testing to make sure that they do not enter the home uh, while they are positive. Um, so this is working. We know that Ottawa, Toronto, Peel, York are hot spots right now. Their prevalence in the community of, of COVID-19 um, is being monitored, and I know that many eyes are on that to assess the situation and understand what can be done. The staffing is a critical piece. We've acknowledged that from the beginning, and we were working Response. on that ever since we were a new ministry in 2000. 
2019 in the summer. Staffing was a priority. We will continue to put dollars behind that as we did last week. We will continue to work on that with a plan with the Ministry. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplement is also for the Premier. Well, there's another record today in Ontario, uh, 797 cases province-wide, Mr. Speaker, and for-profit clinics are charging $250 to skip the long lines at government testing centres. Private pharmacies are making money offering COVID-19 tests, Mr. Speaker, and the Ontario government is shipping COVID-19 samples to private for-profit labs in California, Mr. Speaker, because they haven't invested in public health care here in Ontario. Proudly tested in California at the top of all the test results, Mr. Speaker. How long is the government going to rely on private, for-profit, two-tier American health care to get us through COVID-19? The government house leader to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As uh, the health minister has said, and as the premier has said, uh, uh, testing uh, remains a, a priority for the province of Ontario. We've significantly increased our capacity uh, uh, since the since the first wave, going from uh, 5,000 in the early days to, as the minister of health. Uh, uh, just reported 48,000 uh, yesterday. At the same time, we've been uh, increasing uh, uh, lab capacity, Mr. Speaker. But we will spare no expense to make sure that the people of the province of Ontario, uh, their health and safety is is uh, is maintained, Mr. Speaker. That's why the Minister of Health, uh, the Premier, and this government put forward a significant uh, fall preparedness plan uh, that is working and that is showing results and is, quite frankly, the envy of Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This week, I heard from a parent in my riding, Deb Turkovich. This week, she discovered her daughter's class at 27 students will be increasing. No, not decreasing. More students are returning to the classroom because they are finding that the virtual schools are just not working. We all have heard from parents that are struggling to manage the cost of staying home while losing income. It is clear that this government has not given any real or safe choices for parents. Will the Premier listen to the evidence, listen to the residents of Niagara like Deb, and commit to keeping our children safe by capping class sizes to 15? Minister of Education. Uh, well, I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, obviously, we are fully committed to the safety of children in Niagara and across the province. It's why, Speaker, in Niagara, for the district school board, there's available funding of over $71 million specific for COVID between funding provided by government and the unlocking of reserves. What that has led to is hiring of teachers, it's hiring of custodians, and we're seeing classroom sizes in kindergarten at 20, grade 1 to 3 at 17 children, and grades 4 to 8 at 23, well below the provincial average. What we have said clearly, Speaker, is that in every region, for every student, we will provide them with the funding and the resources to ensure that they are safe, and that is our obligation in all regions of this province. Well the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. We have 14 schools in Niagara with COVID cases so far because community spread is spiraling out of control. That's because community transmission is increasing. For Deb and her family, they know that protecting children cannot be done in schools alone. It takes community with adequate resources. In fact, when Deb's husband presented symptoms for COVID-19, it took him seven days to get a call back for a test. Yes, I said seven days just for a call back. Shame. Families in my riding, St. Catharines and in Niagara, are struggling with unsafe, overcrowded classrooms on one hand and fearing transmission in their community because of under-resourced assessment centres on the other hand. Why is the Premier unwilling and Question. unprepared to fund smaller classrooms or provide resources so assessment centres can keep up? Mr. Vacation. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we should be uh, proudly supporting the work of our frontline health practitioners, our nurses and doctors, our, our teachers and administrators who are working very hard to keep us safe. Mr. Speaker, just for context, in this province, when you compare us to a jurisdiction like Quebec yesterday, they have a population of 8.5 million people, we have 14.5. They tested 20,000 people, we tested well no, more than 40,000. And yet they have three times the cases, wow. two-thirds 
two-thirds speaker, three-fifths the population, half the tests, three times the cases. It is clear, Speaker, we are doing everything possible within our schools, within our communities, to reduce the risk, to Order. ensure our kids are safe. And I am grateful for the work of our doctors and nurses, those in the assessment centres and our teachers, doing everything they can, going above and beyond, to keep this problem. Order. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Minister of Health. Prior to the 2018 election, the Premier on the campaign trail said he was dead against injection sites. He promised to focus on rehabilitation instead. But after winning the election, what did we see? The government decided to fund 21 consumption sites across Ontario. Another flip-flop. Another policy implemented by the previous government that this government has embraced. In August, the Mayor of Cambridge had a delegation meet with the government and requested that the province fund a drug injection site in my riding of Cambridge. Constituents oppose such a move. My question is, does the government intend on funding a drug injection site in the riding of Cambridge? Minister of Health. Well, I'm very proud of our government for supporting consumption and treatment services sites. They're saving lives. They're absolutely necessary, and the communities that have them have reported uh, a significant improvement in results. But there still is more work to do. We have not uh, received applications from all municipalities that want to have consumption and treatment services site in their ridings uh, or in their communities. If they want to, we're examining them very closely, and we encourage municipalities to come forward with them. So uh, any suggestion that this was a wrong decision, I think, would be uh, really uh, rebuked and uh, denied by the communities that already have them, because there is no question they are saving lives. The supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's an interesting response, seeing as how in Alberta, when an in a site was introduced, we saw uh, first, first responders responding to overdose calls on a daily basis, and that went up from 24% to 67%, an increase of 2.5 times, and there are other examples across Canada. In Cambridge, there is a demand for rehabilitation and treatment, for laws to be enforced for criminal acts, not just for people gathering at Thanksgiving, and for jobs. Communities should be given the option to have centres that strictly focus on rehabilitation without consumption. This government has not given communities that choice. They have only a one-size, a fit-soul, take-it-or-leave-it option, a drug injection site, or nothing at all. My question is, will the government provide the communities with the option of applying for centres that only focus on rehabilitation without consumption, or will it stick to funding only these sites? and provide no funding for any other possible solutions like rehabilitation and treatment centres. Minister of Health. Well, to be clear, first of all, municipalities are able to apply for consumption and treatment services sites, and many communities have done that, and as I indicated, they're re receiving good results. However, we also announced yesterday that we are investing $176 million in community mental health supports that are going to be providing rehabilitation services as well. That is going to be open to municipalities to ask for, to apply for, and we are already in the process of working with many communities to do that. We are at KMH yesterday for an announcement where they're opening a, a, a response centre for people who are in a very serious condition. That's been expanded tremendously, and we want to provide other communities across the province with rehabilitation services in addition to consumption and treatment services sites. You're right, the rehabilitation part is, is very important. Sometimes Fonts. people through the consumption and treatment services sites can be helped into rehabilitation after they've been receiving services there. That's part of the purpose that they're there. But we then have to make sure that we have the re rehabilitation. Thank you very much. The next question, member for Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This province is experiencing a homelessness crisis, and yet this government has cut $161 million in supplements uh, for shelter funding. They've frozen funding for the homelessness prevention program. They've cut uh, the ending homelessness program funding by 25 percent. They cancelled the basic income pilot. All these cuts that your government has made are fueling this crisis in the middle of this pandemic. The City of Toronto has released a plan to build 3,000 affordable, supportive housing units immediately and 350,000 over the next 10 years. They are asking for provincial support to fulfil that plan. Will your government commit to supporting the City of Toronto plan to build affordable housing? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, Speaker. Well, thanks, Speaker. Uh, through you to the Honourable Member, I know 
now that he's not the, uh, the finance critic because some of his financial information that he's released both in this House and outside this House are totally incorrect. Our, our government has worked very closely with the City Order. of Toronto and all of our 47 service managers and our two Indigenous program administrators. Just in the House, just a day or two ago, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, in response to a question, talked about how our government, early on in the pandemic, provided $200 million in advance to our municipalities to help those most vulnerable. We followed it up, Speaker. We followed it up, Speaker. Uh, and now the total amount of dollars that we're providing municipalities are over $510 million. Every statistic, and, and again, the, the member talks about saying that community homelessness uh, monies have been cut. That's absolutely false. The, the number he's quoting is from the estimates Response. for the Affordable Lands Project. You can't buy lands twice. We don't buy it every year. We provided an Affordable Lands Project. We created new housing. We moved on to the next program. And again, thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, in June 2019, the Federal Parliamentary Budget Officer reported that the provincial government, your government, cut $161 million from rent supplements and shelter funding. That's the Federal Budget Officer. It's not my numbers, they're the Federal Budget Officer's numbers. Yeah. This week, I was just speaking with the member from St. Catharines. She said that people are lining up for hours around the block at a church to get a shower who are home experiencing homelessness. There are tent encampments in Hamilton. There is one park in my riding with 60 tents and more than 100 people living in, in it. The residents in my riding, business owners and people experiencing homelessness came together this week and we asked three things from this government. Reverse the cuts, declare a state of emergency on homelessness and support the city's plan to build Question. affordable housing. Will you do any of those things to address this crisis? Again, the Minister of right. S Speaker, Speaker, the Canada Ontario Community Housing Initiative dollars for the City of Toronto this year are up from last year. The Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative uh, for the City of Toronto this year is up uh, compared to last year. The, the, the dollars that we provided in the pandemic. $39 million uh, under the community Order. under the social services relief fund. And the fact the city is eligible and, and we're encouraging them to, to ensure that they get their long-term sustainable plan in an additional $118 million. The strong communities rent supplement program was is exactly the same amount of money this year as what the city received last year. In total, uh, the $384 million that the city Response. has received or is eligible for is up compared to last year, up compared to the year before, up compared to the year before, and up compared to the year before that. It's up, up, up. Order. Question period has come to a conclusion. I understand the member for Toronto St. Paul's has a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'm honoured to stand in the legislator, legislation of Ontario today and recognize this month being Women's History Month, and also October 11th is the International Day of the Girl, and October 18th is Persons Day. Uh, may we never forget the undeniable contributions of women and girls past and present, and may each and every one of our actions as legislators seek to uplift and amplify women and girls' voices and act on their calls for justice and equity. Thank you. Technically not a, number, a uh, point of order, but good news nonetheless. And before I recess the House, I want to extend my very best wishes to all the members, uh, their staff, and the staff of the Assembly for a very happy Thanksgiving and a good week next week when you have a chance to be back in your ridings to reconnect with your constituents and your families and do your constituency work. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.